In my last video, I attempted to 3D print a liquid piston engine, and the results were bad. And my reputation, or whatever's left of it, was shattered. So you can bet that as soon as that video went live, I began cracking away the next version, hoping for some better results. Okay, fine, so I took a few months to myself, but now I'm ready. My last design had a few shortcomings. If you haven't seen that video, I'd recommend watching it first to learn all about how this engine works and the many incorrect ways to build one. But I've learned a lot from these last prototypes and I am ready to start my next version from scratch. I've also got a half-functioning dynamometer, which I'll be completing this time around, and running some fun and interesting tests with. It's gonna be a good one. As luck would have it, Onshaped had recently reached out to me asking about using their CAD software and sponsoring this video. I've actually used Onshape a number of times before this, so I was thrilled to be able to work with them. I took this opportunity to redesign my entire project from scratch using their software, taking advantage of a ton of unique features along the way. If you haven't heard of Onshape yet, the best way to describe it is the Google Docs of CAD. Onshape is a cloud-based CAD and PDM software package, which means no more multi-thousand dollar editing machine. You can access Onshape from the browser of any OS from anywhere, always staying in sync. They even have an app that lets you view and edit models on the go. But being cloud-based doesn't mean you need to sacrifice performance. Onshape is still super smooth and responsive, even when moving and editing really large and complicated assemblies. Onshape is easy to learn and built for businesses. It has some really exciting features, like an excellent version control and collaboration system akin to Git, which allows you to try out different versions or variations of a design without losing track of the design history and alternate versions. And they also have software updates including new features and functionality every three weeks, rather than waiting months or even years like the other CAD software. That's why businesses like DHL, Trek, and even Formlabs, where I used to work as an engineer, trust Onshape. I would highly recommend you and your company check out Onshape at www.onshape.pro slash 3D printed life or by clicking the link in the description. And with that, I got to work redesigning the entire engine in Onshape. Usually for a project where a ton of parts are interdependent like this, I would have used or tried to use a master modeling technique. But this time around, I gave Onshape's more unique features a try. This let me model multiple parts in a single file and easily retain dependencies between them. Before I knew it, my design was done again. I exported the parts and began printing. But what exactly did I change this time around? A whole lot, but one change outshines them all, and it's one I didn't even think of until I saw Camden Bowen's design. His video is linked below, and that is turning the camshaft inside out. Basically, what I had before was a center shaft with eccentric lobes where the rotor was. This meant that a whole lot of force was working to twist the tiny shaft and break this assembly, which it did many, many times. And because of the way the feature stacked up, it meant that a super low profile gear tooth and a thin wall was needed here, which also broke a lot. So what did I do? Well, I moved the eccentric lobe portion of the camshaft to the housing and the axial shaft to the rotor. This allowed me to, with the same two millimeter dowel pins, have more room for the gear teeth and transfer significantly more torque through the shaft. Other changes include coating certain pieces in the Stefan tape to reduce friction, printing parts on the FDM printer to allow for quicker iteration and slightly more consistency, and a few other things, but I'll get into those later. With all these changes, I built up the first new prototype and braced myself for immediate, undeniable success. I was, unsurprisingly, disappointed. It didn't run, but despite the failure, there were actually some very bright spots here. For one, the engine did not immediately break when I tried to spin it, so I'm already about 10 steps ahead of the old design. But more importantly, I'm actually getting some intermittent functionality. It's not strong or consistent, so it's nowhere near self-sufficient, but you can actually hear the engine working a little bit. Okay, I will be straight with you guys, this was not my first prototype of the new design. Building miniature rotary engines is more of an art than science. And the act of assembling the engine is usually the biggest deciding factor on whether or not the design's gonna work, though good design can make the assembly easier. But anyway, time to move forwards. Using Onshape, I was able to take advantage of their version control system to save the current design, make a new branch, and try out some new things. If they turn out to be successful, I can merge them back into the master. Or if not, I can just nuke them out of existence. This version control let me test two new ideas without risking my current progress. The first was inspired by my old Winkle design, adding O-rings to the rotor. This should help with sealing and allow a little more lenience in the tolerances, but at the cost of higher friction. Though as it turns out, O-rings on Teflon with PTFE lubricant actually has a very low coefficient of friction, even with a pretty moderate preload. But of course, the engine still doesn't work. 
I'll come back to this idea though. The second idea was to change the port location. Where it is now, the port moves linearly past the intake as the rotor spins, but what if there's a more optimal placement, one where the port stays relatively still throughout the entire expansion cycle of the rotor? As it turns out, this does exist, and it's right around here. If I can get this new location to work, it would allow me to greatly simplify the port design, which, now that I think about it, might be one of my issues. This old design had an intake diameter of only 1.5 millimeters, which is tiny, and it had this very torturous path. The new design would be 2.2 millimeters and a much simpler path. So how much better would that actually be? Well, I could have just built up the prototype, but you know what's more fun? Fluid simulations. By using Boolean operations in Onshape, I was able to generate a positive of the airflow path through the entire assembly for both the old and the new designs which in itself was pretty fun. But now the good stuff. I set up the positives in sim scale to have a 60 psi 3mm diameter input and a 0 psi output to simulate atmosphere. Then I ran both simulations and the result, more beautiful animations. plus some actual valuable information. Straight to the important bit, I measured the intake velocity for both. Since they are the same diameter, this should tell me how much air is going through. And the new design had twice the velocity, so twice the air. That's a big improvement. Good stuff. But that's enough messing around, it's time to actually test these changes. But out of the blue, my printer started having random errors and failing prints. After a little bit of debugging, I believe the thermistor might be fried, so I ordered a replacement, but it's gonna take a few days. In the meantime, let's finish up the dynamometer. A quick recap. The dynamometer uses this variable friction bar clamped onto the shaft to generate the load. The loads measured by the load cell and the rotational speed was previously measured by an encoder. Now this encoder was unnecessarily high resolution and it was spinning way past its rated speed with pretty much all of my air engines. So the garbage was data. To fix it I wanted to use these optical limit switches instead. I'd make my own basic encoder by adding some fins to the flywheel and I can calculate the rotational speed based on the time between switch triggers. First, I'll need to make sure that the switch can actually trigger fast enough to work. I threw a test flywheel I had printed previously on a drill, wrote some code to print the time between triggers, and gave it a test. You'll notice I'm not running this on a standard microcontroller. Meet the MUB. This is a tiny, powerful board of my own design, but I'll get a lot more into this in my next video. Strangely enough, this color PLA actually isn't opaque to IR, which is causing some issues, but coloring it with a Sharpie is enough to fix it which is weird, but whatever. And it looks like I was able to hit four microseconds between pulses with the drill maxing out. So this means at a bare minimum, I can trigger this switch at 250 hertz. But by counting both rising and falling edges separately, I can get 500 hertz. So I decided to add three vanes to the flywheel, which means six pulses per revolution and a 5,000 RPM max speed. One problem though, my printer is still down. So I couldn't print the new flywheel. Time to improvise. It is not pretty, but it will work. So let's run through all the engines. First up, I'm gonna do Integs' remix of my Winkle engine, running straight off of two liters of air at 60 PSI. And it spins fast. And luckily, we have clean data through the full run. Peak power output was about two watts before quickly using the air supply. Next, let's throw my custom air regulator onto this engine. That dropped peak power output significantly, but the power decayed much more slowly, and the work generated was pitiful, about a third that of the last run, but I blame that on my leaky regulator. Alright, now it's time to give Tom Stanton's engine a try. Now you'll remember last time I wasn't actually able to get this engine to work at all just because it runs at such low torque. The setup needs to be really precise in order to measure it without stopping the engine. And this time I was able to. And yeah, it actually just ran for ages at only 20 psi, but the power output is incredibly low, bouncing between 30 and 40 milliwatts. And finally, let's give my original Winkle a go. It took a few attempts, but this was the best run I could get. This engine is as powerful as it is unreliable. 4 watt peak output before it vibrated the load bar off the shaft entirely. And even though it lost about the last half of the run, it still managed to generate 1.5 milliwatt hours of work, which is 50% more than a Texas Air engine. Surprisingly impressive. Well, good news, the new thermistor came in. 
But after replacing it, yep, still having issues. So it took a little more debugging to discover this. Bad crimps, not fun. Rather than wait for more crimps to come in, I'm just gonna solder this and we're back in business. At this point I'm about a dozen prototypes in and I'm printing just about every single part on my FDM printer. It's just so much more consistent and easier to work with. Now, I was getting a bit curious as to what was going wrong, so I took a suggestion from my wife and I added some thinned out red paint to the input of the air engine. Then I held the engine at a position where the rotor port was aligned so it would be adding air into the chamber, gave it a quick burst of air, and then took it apart. The red paint would show me exactly where the air was going, and would you look at that? Pretty much all of the air is just slipping right past the apex seal and going to the exhaust port. <laughs> so one of the other changes that I made on this version was springier apex seals. I thought this would help, but it turns out it just made them not seal quite as well. With this and everything I've learned in mind, I made one last ditch attempt. I changed up the apex seals so that they'd push more tightly against the rotor, added threaded inserts on the printed base so I can clamp everything together more tightly, added smaller o-rings to the rotor seals to maybe reduce friction further, made the intake port even larger, and also the exhaust port a bit larger, and... nothing. I did have one final trick up my sleeve. Since the Teflon tape works so well to reduce friction on the housing, maybe I could somehow use this on the rotor itself. And as it turns out, I could. I was able to not only cover all the walls of the rotor, but it also folded over and covered the o-rings on the top and bottom as well, which should help reduce friction even further. And after reprinting the top of the housing in clear resin again, I gave this engine one last chance. I pumped up the 2 liter tank to 60 psi and opened the valve. It still didn't work, but there were clear signs of life here, and I just could not stop now. I took apart the engine, repacked it with grease, and tried again. Not quite, but did you see that grease fly? No, not the grease that's now coating my computer. The grease that flew out the side of the housing. That is not supposed to happen. I tore apart the engine again, and this time superglued the base of the housing to the walls. This should stop any more leaks from happening here, and... Almost. This is the closest it's been. It's almost running on its own, it seems like it's just getting stuck at top dead center of each stroke. Which makes sense, because this is the transition point between chambers, when it stops filling the previous one and starts on the next one. Maybe larger intake o-rings could do the trick? I swapped out the 6mm ones I've been using for 7mm ones, and I gave it a go. And it worked. It actually worked. And it worked so well. It was smooth, quiet, and the sound was incredible. It reminded me of like a vintage propeller plane, which is just awesome. Nearly a year's worth of work has finally paid off. And now it's time to put this newly functioning engine on the dyna. You might be surprised to learn that this engine is also pretty unreliable, though it's actually a lot better than my original Wankel. And after a few attempts, and some strange results, this was the best run that I could get. A respectable peak power output of 1.3 watts, and surprisingly good efficiency. Overall, I'm super happy with how well this engine performed. This is the best sealing engine I've created to date, and the sound is a testament to that. It took an insane amount of time, engineering, building, and testing, but the end result was so worth it. So if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and consider joining my Patreon, link is below. If you have any future video suggestions, leave a comment. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed, until next time.